guys. I know everyone always says this, but it'll be great to keep your Bibles open, uh, especially so because I'm going to be trawling through the whole passage verse by verse. So definitely check what I'm saying is right, um, and that will be most helpful uh, for me and for you. Um, But before we get into it, why don't I pray as we try and understand God's Word to us. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you've given us your Word. I thank you that it acts as a guiding light um, in the dark world that we live in, Lord. I pray you would help us to pay attention to it um, now uh, and for the rest of our lives. And we thank you so much um, that we can know you um, through your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I also don't have any slides up on the screen because I thought that would be a little bit confusing for myself. So definitely check the Bible and what I'm saying here. So, Where is God calling you? Have, it, have you ever th- felt or thought, I know God is calling me to do this? Because throughout history, people have done all sorts of things because they felt that it was God's calling on their life. People have become ministers, missionaries, and even built hospitals, all because they felt called by God to do so. But some people have done terrible, terrible things and have also said they were called by God. So what do we make of all this? Are these people really called by divine power, by God? Or are they all just crazy religious fanatics? I mean, I've never really felt called by God to go or do anything. But is that just because I'm not spiritual enough? Because I have met people who say they felt called by God to marry a particular someone or to become a minister or to go and do mission overseas. But when somebody says, I feel like God's calling me to mission in Tanzania, how can they really be sure? I mean, if someone is willing to go over and be a missionary, that's wonderful. God bless them, right? But I would caution them from using this term, calling. Because what if it all falls apart and they can't go? Is it suddenly not God's calling anymore? Or what if you're feeling called to marry a particular somebody, but then they break up with you? I mean, do you just keep trying to win them back because that's where God's calling you? Or what if you feel called to become a minister, but everyone around you knows that's a bad idea? It can almost be used as a trump card sometimes, can't it? Oh, Thanks for your concern, but uh, God's actually called me to this. So why don't you just uh, take that up with him? He's actually in charge, so thanks. Over the last few years, as I've gone into ministries, I'm fairly new to all of this, I've had quite a few people talk to me saying that this language of calling or being called into ministry can often be unhelpful because it's powerful language, but it can be misunderstood. But thankfully, God gave us this chapter in 2 Peter, because in it we find out what it truly means to be called by God. Turns out that it's not a calling to a certain ministry or place or career or person. And it's not just for the spiritually elite. Thank goodness. It's a calling for everyone. So, where is God calling us? He's calling us to Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, then your God-given calling is to him. And this calling, it's so much more wonderful than any ministry, place, or career. It's to the divine and powerful Lord Jesus himself. And as I've spent time in this passage, my heart has been gripped afresh by God's calling on my life. And I pray that he will do the same for you. So we're going to start at verse 1 and move through to verse 11. And we see Peter kicks off in this chunk by showing us what it means to be called to Jesus and how a believer can respond to this wonderful call. Verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus have received a faith as precious as ours. In opening his letter, Peter kicks things off with an interesting remark. Did you catch it? He wants them to know that Their faith is as precious as ours. 
ours meaning the apostles. So if you compare the faith of an apostle, someone who walked and talked with and met Jesus, with the faith of your stock standard believer, you will see that they are the same. They share the same faith because it came from the same source, Jesus. Verse 2, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter loves these believers. and He wants them to know and experience the reality of God's grace and peace in their lives. And believers get more and more and more of this so that it's in abundance through their knowledge of him. Now, when you read the word knowledge, what does it make you think of? University, school, academic type stuff, yeah? And sometimes when we think about our knowledge of Jesus, we can think about it as more of an academic exercise. But if I asked you for the knowledge you have of your brother, your sister, or your friend, well, that doesn't really seem like academic knowledge at all, does it? Friends, Jesus is a person too. And when Peter talks about knowledge, he's not just talking about knowing all the facts, but the commitment and experience that comes from knowing somebody. And how would you get to know your brother or your sister or your friend? By spending time with them, by listening to them, and by walking through life together. And this is what it means to have knowledge of Jesus. It's really knowing him. And you experience the reality of his grace and peace in your life as you know him. But what makes this all possible? Verse 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for living a godly life through our knowledge. Well, when I was born, no surprises, I started off with uh, two arms, two legs, a heart, lungs, the full kid, I got it all. And just like how the human body starts off with everything it needs for life on earth, so too Does the believer start off with everything they need for living a godly life? It's not like some days I'm going to wake up without arms or legs, am I? And if you know Jesus, then you also have everything you need every single day. And it's after this comforting truth that we have everything we need for this life that Peter tells us where our life is going. Second half of verse 3. Of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Him who called. Jesus calls us to himself. And this is how the Bible uses the language of calling. It's not a special calling to ministry or mission or marriage. It's Jesus calling you saying, come to me. And we've been called to Jesus because of his good and gloriousness by his own goodness and glory which he has to the highest degree verse 4 through these he's given us great and precious promises so that through them you might participate in the divine nature having escaped from the corruption in the world caused by evil desires because of jesus glory and goodness he hasn't just left us in the dark has he We've been given precious promises of light. But when Peter says that they've been given promises, is he talking about the promises that he's written about in this letter? Or about different promises? Well, I think he's talking about promises these believers already have in the Scriptures. Because God gives us his promises in the Scriptures. And these are the promises that enable us to escape the world's corruption. And for the believers that Peter was writing to at this particular point in time, 2,000 years ago, this was a big problem. Because these guys had corrupt, false teachers, twisted by greed and sexual desire in their churches. And they were telling them that living a godly life, well, it didn't matter. And that's why Peter reminds them that they share the same faith, back in verse 1. Because all believers, whether you're an apostle or not, have been called to Jesus himself. 
And if you follow Jesus' voice when he says, come to me, you can escape the corruption of the world. And God's promises are like the key that opens the door to our escape. Now, there's something in verse 4 that's so incredibly mind-blowing, yet I missed it on my first read-through, and you might have done so as well. Halfway through verse 4, so that through them you might participate in the divine nature. Okay, so apparently the door that we escape through isn't just any old door, uh, it's the doorway to share in the divine nature. So you're telling me right now that we mere lowly sinful human beings can share in God's divine nature? Like, I'm sorry, what? I thought the thing that made us different from God was that he's divine and we're clearly not. So how does this all work? If I share in God's divine nature, does that mean that I'm going to become all-powerful, that I can do anything I want, move beyond the laws of space and time, click my fingers and have it all? Well, I'm not sure if that's the case, and I'm super thankful that Peter then explains to us what this looks like to share in the divine nature. Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Peter gives us a list of wonderful qualities, and it starts with faith and ends with love. And when we think about what it looked like for God to become a man, we can start to get our head around what it really means to share in the divine nature. Because Jesus embodied all of these qualities perfectly. And this is what Peter means by divine nature. To share in God's divine nature is to become more like Jesus. And Jesus has called you to himself. And Peter says, well, we should make every effort to respond to this wonderful call to Jesus. But responding to a call isn't like you're just picking up the phone and saying, yes, sweet Jesus, thanks for that offer, I got you. Um, it's more like a lifelong respond, response than a hill sprint. Jesus isn't up the top of the hill and you just zoom up the hill. It's like a lifelong response to Jesus' call. And Peter tells us to make every effort. And I don't know about you, when I hear the word effort, I just get a little bit tired. Like, that looks like a lot of work. I think I'm actually going to pass on that one, sorry. However, this isn't always the case. Because I've actually started playing beach volleyball recently. And when you play beach volleyball, surprise, surprise, it's a lot of effort. But I don't just throw in the towel, I keep playing. And I tire myself out playing beach volleyball because I absolutely love it. And it's similar to those of you who play any sort of sport or do any sort of exercise you love. When Peter says make every effort, it's towards something wonderful. It's towards Jesus. But how do I make every effort when I'm given a list like this? Is this like a step-by-step -step process or a guide that I need to follow to reach Jesus? Well, I think a helpful way of thinking about it is less of a to-do list and more of an ingredients list. Think of these as the ingredients to a big Jesus hot pot that you're cooking up, right? And so when you're cooking this hot pot, you're going to want to make sure everything's in there and that there's lots of it. So you're going to add some goodness in, then reflects the practical, caring nature of Jesus. You're going to want to pour in some self-control so that you don't give in to your own lusts and sinful desires. You're going to add some perseverance so that you can continually plod along faithfully when times are tough. You're going to add in mutual affection as you put the needs of other believers above your own. And of course, you're going to want to pour a whole bunch of love in there and mix it all around as it ties everything together. And all of these things are wonderful qualities, aren't they? And being a follower of Jesus is a wonderful way to live. And I want to live a wonderful life, don't you? 
Because if you don't know Jesus, then you're missing out. You're missing out on this wonderful life with these beautiful qualities. And as believers, we know this. So because we know it and we love it, and we think that these things are delicious, we're going to make every effort. Verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when you grow to become more like Jesus, you also become more productive and useful. And I used to have the complete wrong idea about what it meant to be a productive and effective Christian. I thought that if I was super busy with church, that that would mean I'm being productive, right? And if I'm in more ministry, then that will mean that I'm more effective, right? It sort of seems to make sense. But... I think that that's not really what's happening here. And it's not as clear-cut as that. And Peter says that if you want to be a productive Christian, then you need to keep growing more like Jesus. That is really what's going to make us productive. And we become more useful for God and his kingdom as we grow. And know this, friends, God loves to see us grow, doesn't he? It brings him great joy as it does us. And the truth is that we need to keep growing and keep adding these delicious qualities to our life. It's not something that we're going to complete this side of eternity. So as Peter stirs up followers of Jesus to pursue their wonderful calling, he's also aware that not everyone who says they follow Jesus does keep growing. Verse 9, But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Peter then makes a really sharp turn here um, to address those who aren't growing. And they've stopped growing because they've forgotten where they've come from and where they're going. They've lost their bearings. If you've ever tried using a compass and got it horribly wrong like me, you'll know what I'm talking about. And Peter is saying that these people are nearsighted and blind, meaning they can't see the eternal kingdom ahead of them. And they've also forgotten that they've been cleansed from their past sins, so they continue to roll around in the mud of them. They've forgotten their past. It's like they've swapped north for east and up for down. They're just directionless. And we need to remain grounded in our direction as believers. From our birth in the Christian life, when Jesus cleansed us from our sins, all the way through to the eternal kingdom waiting for us. And people who've forgotten where they've come from and where they're going will be unproductive or useless in their so-called knowledge of Jesus. Verse 10, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. If you work hard at growing in godliness and becoming more like Jesus, then you're never going to stumble or fall away. Be sure of this, because God will give you a grand entrance into his eternal kingdom. And what a great comfort that is for us. But when we confirm our calling, it isn't like how we'll confirm a doctor's appointment. We don't text back why to Jesus and say, yep, lock me in, I'm all good. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a -a tick-a-box kind of thing. We confirm our calling with a lifelong response. So I confirm my marriage every day that I wake up and continue to be married to my wife. I'm confirming something that's already in place. And it's only after hearing Jesus' call, saying, come to me, that you can confirm it. Because before Jesus called us, well, we were face down in the mud of our sins, weren't we? We weren't breathing, we were dead. And it was only because of God's divine power, back in verse 3, that we've been picked up, cleaned off, 
had breath put into our lungs so that when Jesus says, come to me, we can answer his call. And he will give us a grand entrance into his eternal kingdom. And Peter has just, verses 1 to 11, run through and reminded the believers of this wonderful calling to Jesus. And he thought this was so important, this is how he chose to start his letter. He then spends the remainder of chapter 1 encouraging the believers to always remember this truth that he's just spelled out, and he shows them where they can continue to look to find it. Verse 12. So I'll always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So it looks like Peter knows that he's going to die soon. And he realizes that this stuff is so important that you can't forget it. So he writes them this letter that we're reading right now. But it seems odd that he'd want to remind them of a truth that we read they're already standing so firm in. Well, he does this because that truth was under threat. Which truth in particular? The truth that Jesus is going to come back. Verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. And the false teachers that these believers were plagued with, they were heaping allegations on Peter, this special apostle they were listening to, saying, look, he's only making up stories about Jesus' return. He went up into heaven and he's not coming back. But why does Peter see this issue, Jesus' return, as such an important thing to defend? I mean, we see chapter 2, he spends the whole thing on the false teachers. I mean, why doesn't he start with them? And he chooses to go to Jesus' return instead. Well, Peter starts here because Jesus' return is fundamental to everything. Everything that Peter's just spelled out in 1 to 11 is grounded in the glorious return of Jesus. If Jesus doesn't come back, there's going to be no judgment for any sort of ungodly living. All the evil that we see or have experienced will go unpunished. So what does Peter say to these people who say Jesus isn't coming back? I mean, surely, surely he's going to clearly explain to them that, um, excuse me, I saw Jesus rise from the dead and he ascended up into heaven from which he's going to come back down and return. It's that simple. But instead, he speaks about a different event in Jesus' life. From verse 16b onwards. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Okay, so Peter doesn't go to the resurrection at all. He goes straight to the transfiguration. But if you wanted to prove that Jesus was coming back, surely you would go to the empty tomb and the resurrection, right? I mean, that's what I would do, not the transfiguration. Why would he do that? And you'll notice, because we have the reading for us beforehand, that he leaves out some really key details too. I mean, in the Gospel account of Mark, we read about Jesus' shining face and Moses and Elijah were there too. Did Peter just run out of room on his parchment? Well, he actually excluded those details on purpose so he could focus in on the voice of the Father from heaven. And God the Father is actually alluding to two Old Testament verses, two Old Testament texts at the Transfiguration. The first is when God the Father says, This is my Son whom I love. He's actually alluding to Psalm 2, verse 7, which says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, 
You are my son. Today, I've become your father. And the second thing he says is, With him, I am well pleased. And he's actually alluding to Isaiah 42, verse 1, which says, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I'll put my spirit in him, and he will bring justice to the nations. What the Father does by going to these passages is confirm his own Old Testament promises about the one who will rule for eternity, the one who will bring justice to the nations. At the transfiguration, the Father himself confirms who Jesus is. And Peter heard God at that mountain confirm, Jesus is the one, the one I've been talking about, and he will return to live and reign in his eternal kingdom as judge. In verse 19, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And because of this experience, the apostles have even greater confidence in the scriptures as the Old Testament and the New Testament have aligned perfectly. The Jesus that we read about in the New Testament is the eternal ruler and judge that God promised us from the Old Testament. And we can trust the scriptures because they do perfectly align. Prophecies made hundreds of years ago are fulfilled in Jesus. The Bible isn't humanity's greatest attempt to hoodwink you. It's the reliable word of God. And continuing in verse 19, And you will do well to pay attention to it, as a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And believers should pay careful attention to the scriptures because they point us to Jesus. Until the day dawns and he finally returns, we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. And these scriptures hold the promises of God, which are the key that unlocks the door to his divine nature. And they're described as a light shining in a dark place. The world in which we live is corrupt and full of darkness, uncertainty and sin. And we should treat these scriptures as a guiding light in this dark place until Jesus returns. In verse 20, Peter says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets spoke, though human, from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Above all, Peter wants them to realize that no prophet interpreted God's word as he pleased. The prophets in the Old Testament didn't do that, and Peter, well, he's not doing that either as an apostle. Jesus' return isn't a twisted fairy tale. I mean, listen to what Peter says later in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Us, Peter's saying. He wants them to pay attention to both the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures. Why? Because they show the truth of who Jesus really is, that he will return. So after moving through this whole chapter, you might want to think to yourself, where is God calling you? Well, he's calling you to Jesus. He's calling you to know him better and to share in his divine love today. And if you don't know Jesus, then... I'm sorry, but you're really missing out, aren't you? Missing out on divine love, missing out on eternal life, missing out on knowing the eternal king. But you don't have to miss out. Pick up the scriptures as your guiding light and meet Jesus in his word. And for those of you who do know Jesus, 
or we should confirm his wonderful calling with a lifelong response and make every effort towards these things. And if you're someone who has been making every effort, well, thanks be to God for that. But even the things we love, like beach volleyball, can be tiring sometimes, right? And friends, if you're really feeling tired in the Christian life from all of your efforts, I want to encourage you to keep going. Keep making every effort because there's no greater calling worth exhausting yourself on than Jesus himself. And Jesus doesn't promise us that this life will be easy, but he does promise that he'll be with us every step of the way and that we have everything we need every single day. So keep going. But maybe you haven't been making every effort. Maybe Jesus is more of an occasional thing in your life than the driving force of everything you do. And if this is you, then I totally get it. Because the world is constantly telling us to put our efforts elsewhere. And sometimes they can be pretty convincing. But if your heart has been gripped afresh by God's calling on your life in his word, and you want to start making every effort, you want to confirm the wonderful calling to Jesus then here's what I want you to ask yourself. What does one step towards Jesus look like? Just one step. Does it look like spending more time in God's word every day, drinking deeply from the scriptures that point us to Jesus? Does it look like pouring some more ingredients into that delicious Jesus hot pot that you're cooking up? What are you running low on in particular? Patience? Self-control? Love? What does one step towards Jesus look like for you? And don't tell me you can't take that step. Because God's given us everything that we need to take it. And nobody wants us to take that step more than Jesus himself. He is cheering alongside and powering us every step of the way. And isn't it wonderful that we have a God who loves to love and he wants to see us grow? So don't waste your time making every effort elsewhere. Give all your efforts to Jesus. Drink deeply from the scriptures and hold tightly on to the promises of God because our God loves to save and he will carry you through to the end so you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ let me pray dear lord thank you so much that you have called us to your son jesus christ thank you that you love us and that we can share in your wonderful divine nature I pray that we would hold on to your promises tightly as we look to your word, Lord. Thank you that it is reliable, that we do have your word, and that we will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place, Lord. Thank you that you love to see us grow, and I pray that you will help us to keep making these steps towards Jesus, and that we would confirm this wonderful calling towards him with a lifelong response filled with love. In his name we pray, amen.